to set out a few things um, to inform the, the other two presentations and the rest of the... So um, just to begin with the big picture, transport is the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases in terms of sectors in Scotland. Um, and it's actually, the levels are actually up on 1990 levels. So it's not just that it's a huge amount of greenhouse gases, it's that nothing's been done, right? Nothing to try and address that for 30 years. And now, um, you know, I'll get to the, the huge changes we've seen in coronavirus in a minute, but up until then, very tiny measures like low emission zones and a, a slight increase in active travel budget, though it's nowhere close to where it needs to be and where um, countries that actually prioritise cycling um, have it. So there's a huge amount to do on transport and reducing emissions and the Climate Change Targets Act um, and the 2030 target for that means we need to do a lot of it over the next 10 years. As well as that, Glasgow City Council and City of Edinburgh Council have these targets for carbon neutral by 2030 and we can problemize carbon neutral as a term when we have more time. But um, nonetheless, those, that's still really ambitious and that means in those two cities and the surrounding areas, a lot needs to be done on transport specifically. Um, right, and alongside, so alongside the need to change transport for greenhouse gas emissions, I'm the air pollution campaigner, representative there, Scotland, right? Air pollution is causing a public health crisis it, causes not just two and a half thousand premature deaths in Scotland every year, but it damages our hearts and our lungs. So it's causing or it worsens a lot of these underlying conditions that we hear so much about that put people at you know, increased vulnerability to COVID-19. So there are our transport systems, so prioritizing of uh, fossil fuel vehicles, and our susceptibility to, um, to COVID-19. Um, so that means not just that we need to reduce emissions over the next 10 years for climate, but there's also for public health reasons, we really need to start working out how to reduce the number of fossil fuel vehicles and make it easier for people to make su sustainable journeys. Um, Right, okay. And so in, in the coronavirus era, in the last couple of months, we've seen this huge change. So public transport is a site of risk, so we have to limit the number of people taking public transport for the time being, but a lot more people walking, cycling and working from home. So they, those are three like, big changes in terms of how we were living and government priorities. Um, and if if those continue in anywhere like the scale that they have done the last few months, then our, you know, our spending priorities are all wrong in terms of from, from the Scottish government level. Uh, but another thing I want to say is that a lot of uh, councils, particularly city councils, are taking the initiative and are using Scottish government funding to widen pavements, to create pop-up cycle lanes, and to build out little, you know, little areas of public space around busy areas. So around shops at the moment, but pretty soon around schools, I think, so that mums and dads can pick up kids, but keep distant from one another. So a lot more public space being created at the expense in a lot of areas from the private car. So that is good from a sustainable transport way. We are starting to change the hierarchy and prioritise people over cars. One of the things I want to say about that, just in terms of um, uh, the, the themes that Mary and Ryan set out um, this morning about how we can make sure that there's a transition that's fair and that um, any changes happen equitably, is that I want people to be thinking about it, not just in cities on the outskirts of cities, but also in in less dense local authority areas, it's important that those gains in public space are shared equitably. In other words, it's important that it's not just the already wealthy affluent areas that maybe get some new cycle lanes and it's really pleasant to move around, but the air pollution and the traffic congestion and the risk of traffic accidents stays in um, less well-off 
areas. I think there's uh, questions about how to introduce active travel infrastructure equitably, which Andrew can maybe speak to. Um, but also that the new public spaces that are being created, which are great, particularly in Edinburgh, have got a lot of plans for pedestrianisation or semi-pedestrianisation. But as I think it's important that we make sure that's not just captured by um, coffee shop, uh, global coffee shop brands that then get to use this space, which should be shared by everyone, but they get to use it for their own profit. Um, so that's something that I just want everyone to keep in mind. And yeah, so things like local authority policy measures, like thinking about access to bikes, particularly cargo bikes and e-bikes for um, small businesses, particularly in areas is of deprivation um, in those cities can start to make sure that we're, um, yeah, we're remaking our cities, but we're trying to do it equitably rather than just ways that um, benefit rich people and, and large businesses and things like that. And then the final thing that I just wanted to say in terms of equity is um, there's, there's a lot of worry about how when we move out of this period of lockdown that we'll return to cars because a lot of people can't take public transport there'll be a rush back to cars and that, and that therefore we'll have a corresponding rise in emissions from transport and air pollution that we've seen in this period. Lots of people don't have a car right lots of people don't have access to a car so they can't just like start driving where they would have taken the bus before that's not an option for loads and loads of people so i think i understand that worry i understand where that comes from but it's not like everyone that was taking the bus before just has a car that they chose not to drive scotland and you know even scotland's densely populated cities allows you to drive your car anywhere you want at any time like it doesn't uh discourage unfortunately it didn't discourage car driving so I, my concern is not the rush back to cars, it's what happens to people who depended on the bus travel before that was expensive in a lot of ways, unreliable sometimes, um, but now there might be restrictions on that and reduced services. And how are those people being um, catered for in our transport system, which is prioritised like single occupancy fossil fuel private car use? Anyway, okay, I'll leave it there. Those are just some of the thoughts that um, I've been having through this coronavirus period. Um, and then I'll pass to Andrew from Sustrans, um, who's going to speak with um, much more insight and intelligence than me. Don't be too hard on yourself there, Gavin, but thank you. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Adam. I am a policy officer with Sustrans Scotland. If you don't know who we are, we are the charity that makes it easier for people to walk and cycle. So our focus is on walking and cycling or active travel. Um, I will just share some slides with you. I'm not going to be showing slides for the whole of this because um, it can get a bit overwhelming after a while. So we'll have a few slides to start with and I'll just talk to you a bit. So transport and just transition. Um, if I can make the slides change. There we go. So today I'm going to talk about the imbalance and injustice that's embedded into our current transport system. I'll talk about the new challenges and new insights that have been thrown up by the COVID-19 building on what Kevin was talking about just there. And our key focus, talking about how we should need to switch our focus in our society to prioritise accessibility over mobility. So our current transport system is very much a one-size-fits-all approach, where that size is a two-ton metal box. So the scenes like this are scenes that you get in towns and cities across the country. Um, cars cause 40% of transport emissions in Scotland. As Gavin said, the transport emissions are the biggest chunk, the biggest single sector contributor to carbon emissions. And even if we had 100% electric vehicle sales by 2030, two years ahead of the government's target, that would still require a 20% drop in car mileage by then for us to be able to contrib contribute a fair share of carbon, carbon cuts from transport. But we can move from a system that's car dominated like this image to something that's much more people centric like this image. I'll come back to this later to talk about where it is and what it signifies. 
our current transport system is discriminatory. There's no other way to put it. It's based on a presumption of car ownership, wherein up to 49% of households in the most deprived areas don't have access to a car. It's designed around nine to five office commutes that o and overlooks shift work that is often lower paid and disproportionately carried out by women and people with, from black or ethnic minority backgrounds. It's designed around A to B journeys rather than those trips that go from home to school, to the shops, to work that are mainly carried out by women. It, it relies on major roads cutting through inner cities, imposing poor air quality on low income households. And shockingly, children in Scotland's 20% most deprived communities are three times as likely to be in a collision with a motor vehicle as children in the least deprived 20% communities. It's, it's really startling. Meanwhile, the current pandemic has thrown up a whole array of other challenges to our society, some of which Gavin touched on. One of the ones that I think it's really important to talk about is online shopping, because um, we talk a lot about passenger transport, but transport isn't just cars, it's also cargo transport. In May, online sales were 130-30% higher than they were at the same time last year, while sales in shops had dropped by 18%, 87%. That means more vans on our roads and it means another challenge for our high streets. So it's a challenge in terms of transport and it's a challenge in terms of economy. Those two are very closely interconnected. Meanwhile, public transport has really been squeezed by public fear and capacity has been reduced by between 70 and 90 percent on most services. So that means that operators are desperately short on revenue and they may go out of business. You may have heard that last month, Transport for, Scott, Transport for London needed a £1.6 billion bailout because they came within six hours of going bankrupt. Car, the risk is, and as, as Gavin touched on this earlier, there's the risk that a lot of people will be forced back into cars to make their everyday journeys, and that shuts out those who don't have access to cars and increases um, carbon emissions. But governments are acting to address this with temporary measures, like Gavin mentioned, um, in Milan, in Berlin, in London, in Dublin. There's some amazing measures being put in place. And there's a £30 million fund from the Scottish government that has shown that we can make these transformative changes really quickly if we have the political will to do so. But there's other stuff that we've learned from this pandemic as well. We've learned how important green space is and how critical that is in, in terms of um, equity and how the, that society is divided between those who have gardens and those who don't. Um, we've learned that many of us can work from home, though we don't necessarily want to do it all the time, but again, people on lower incomes are less likely to be able to do so. We can attend conferences as we are doing at the moment, so we don't necessarily need to travel as much to share knowledge, to share experiences, to learn from one another. We enjoy car-free roads and with improved air quality that comes with them. And we discovered that life is easier when the services you need are close to you. And that's where we need to start talking about accessibility and the solutions that we need to change our transport system. So we need to start thinking about transport as mobility and prioritise accessibility to services and accessibility to transport. In terms of access to services, one of the key policy changes we could make is to talk about our planning system and moving towards a 20 minute neighbourhood model. That's a model where everyday services, things like schools, shops, GPs, parks, workspaces, are within a 20 minute walk of your home. That makes active travel, walking, cycling and using mobility aids the default choice for people's travel and makes services more accessible for everyone. But that requires us to shift our thinking from mobility, where it's making it as easy as possible for people to travel long distances, to accessibility, where we make those services more accessible. And there are a wealth of other reasons why we should take that approach. It can help regenerate our high streets, creating places for work, for leisure, for retail. And that's going to be really important as part of the green recovery from this crisis. We can be rethinking the uses of our high streets. We can have more community spaces. We can have more shared workspaces in local areas. So you get the office experience without necessarily needing to spend an hour in a car to get to one office that is identical to one that's a five minute walk from where you live. We can use things like measures like cargo consolidation hubs on the edges of cities to minimise van and lorry traffic that's coming into the city. And we can um, place a greater emphasis on having pickup points within our high streets to maintain footfall in shops. This is a, this is a 
concept that's great in getting increasing traction around the world. Melbourne's the world leader, but the Paris mayor is um, standing for re-election on the basis of creating 15-minute cities on the same principle. And there are examples in the UK as well. So the photo that I showed you earlier that I will try to bring back up now. Um, here we go. So this is Waltham Forest um, in London. This used to be a busy road, two-way traffic, um, when proposals were brought in to reduce traffic flows and make it more people-centric like this. Some local traders thought it was gonna kill off their businesses, um, but instead you can see it's become this really vibrant neighborhood. Um, to move on to the next slide, um, simple measures like this, modal filters that you can do as simply as just putting a planter on a road that prevents through traffic and rat running down quiet residential streets, but it still, allow, it still allows people and bikes to move back and forth. Um, and you can have more green space, which helps with the resilience to climate change, as well as making it just a nicer place to live. So the other side of accessibility is access to transport. Um, we need to lower the access barrier to, um, uh, to cycling by offering loans and grants for the purchase of bikes. Um, for those people who don't want to own a bike because they don't have space to store it, providing cheap bike sharing schemes beyond city centres, which can include um, e-bikes in rural areas, but rural areas will need a very different transport approach to cities. We can extend the sharing approach to electric vehicle sharing schemes for journeys where cars or vans make the most sense. Um, but if we foster that move for car ownership, from car ownership to car accessibility, it frees up street space because cars spend 96% of their time parked, just taking up space that we could be using for other things. I'm running out of time, so I'll just rattle through the last couple of points. Um, Ellie will talk about public transport in a minute, but improving regularity and affordability of public transport, particularly buses, is really crucial um, because they're a lifeline to poorer and more rural communities. We need to design infrastructure with multimodal trips in mind, so you can go from your bike to your train to your bus, you can walk the last section and make that convenient and easy with smart ticketing, for example. And we need high quality active travel infrastructure that works for the people who need it most. Sorry, my cat's attacking my arm, which is an entertaining way to finish on. Um, to wrap up, transformational change is upon us in terms of our transport system. It's now up to us as to how we shape it. To leave you with a visual thought, this morning I looked out my window in a quiet suburban cul-de-sac, I could see 33 cars and a caravan. There's less than 30 houses visible, but there's all these cars just sitting there parked during the day. Think of what we could do with that space. We could have play parks, we could have public green space, we could have outdoor seating for cafes, which we're going to need over the next coming months. Um, we could have more front gardens again. I think the key message I want to leave you on is that we don't need a one size fits all transport system. We can't just say bikes can do everything, buses can do everything, we can't. A bike can't replace a car, but together a bike, public transport and a car club can. It can save people money, it can make transport more accessible. On that note, I am going to pass on to Ellie so she can talk a bit more about public transport. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen. So I've got a few, slides um, right go back to the beginning um, hopefully you can see that so hi everyone thanks for coming to the transport session very excited to be here my name's Ellie Harrison I'm the current chair of the Get Glasgow Moving campaign. We're a volunteer run campaign founded in 2016 to demand better public transport for everybody in the greater Glasgow region um, and this region is, of course, the most populous part of Scotland and has some of the worst poverty and deprivation in the country. It has some of the lowest levels of car ownership and as a result has the largest number of people who are dependent on buses. Yet, we have a shambolic and overpriced public transport system which is completely failing to deliver and it's exploiting the poorest in our society with rip-off bus fares and leaving many of our communities stranded. So improving public transport 
is essential for tackling these ingrained inequalities, for building thriving local economies, and of course, for tackling climate change. So Get Glasgow Moving wants to see a fully integrated and accessible public transport network that's easy and affordable for everybody to get around. So you can hop from the bus to the subway to the train with coordinated timetables, interchanges and one simple ticket for, for use across all transport modes. It really sounds like common sense, doesn't it? And in most other developed countries, Switzerland, Germany, Austria are great examples. They have this kind of system. The only reason that we can't can't do it in the UK um, is because of all of our all of our public transport was deregulated and privatised in the 1980s and the 1990s, and as a result, we've seen millions, literally millions, of miles of routes bus routes cut because they weren't seen as profitable anymore by these private bus companies and fare hikes on the remaining routes. So this has left us with a completely fragmented system where you have so many competing private companies running different buses and trains that we that we simply do not have the cooperation necessary to deliver this coordinated service. Public transport is now run as a business and not a service and that is what we urgent, urgently need to change. So this report from Transport for Quality of Life in 2016 shows how much re-regulating and our re-regulating our buses or bringing them back into public ownership how much that's necessary to deliver the world-class service which we need to fight climate change and to match up to um, other, most other European countries. So not only will that deliver, enable us to plan and coordinate routes to serve communities' needs, especially those in our most deprived areas, but it would also save us money. So the Scottish Government spends about £300 million of public money on bus services every year and this is a completely inefficient use of public money um, through this present privatised model with profits being hived off to shareholders. First Bus, the, the, the big operator in, in Glasgow, is actually part owned by um, a hedge fund called Coast Capital based in the Rockefeller Tower of New York. So that says it all really. Um, so what do we need to do to address this? Um, we need to take back our buses. Um, but to this, I just wanted to highlight this report which came out um, at the end of last year which really has a lot of the solutions in it, written by Transport for Quality of Life and um, commissioned by Friends of the Earth. Um, and it starts off by highlighting the scale of the challenge that we face, which Gavin touched on. This is UK-wide data, but in Scotland, transport is also the biggest contributor to carbon emissions and air pollution of all of the sectors in Scotland's economy and the only one that's increased since the Climate Act of, of uh, 2009. So this report shows that in order to meet that 1.5 degree um, target set out in the Paris Agreement, car, car mileage will have to be cut by as much as 60% by 2035. Um, that is a massive task, which I don't think any of our politicians have properly grasp um, and the report goes details how we go about doing that so we need universal and comprehensive public transport we need universal and comprehensive active travel infrastructure everybody can access these things um, and it's all free to use on a local level and that is paid for with an eco levy on driving which charges um, drivers per mile um, so the ambition is that everybody can fully participate in society without need or aspiration to own a car. So I want to contrast that with what we are doing in Scotland, um, which as I said is uh, no, none of our politicians have properly grasped the scale of the challenge that we face. Um, and instead in 2018, 
they introduced a rather pathetic and piecemeal transport bill to the part Scottish Parliament, which was actually largely based on the Transport Services, the Bus, the bus Services Act from England um, from 2017. This transport bill failed to address transport as a holistic um, system to look at it in an integrated way and to address the massive inequalities in the system that we're left with as a result of privatisation. You can see there the contrast in bus fares in Edinburgh where they have publicly owned buses and in Glasgow where we're stuck with first. Um, so we campaigned for three years to get amendments to that bill to allow for publicly owned buses um, and we were successful in winning those so that the transport bill became the act in 2019 and we are now continuing to lobby to get our regional transport authority to actually use those powers because the bus um, the, bu the private bus companies have so much power um, and they obviously don't want their profits eaten into. We've got a massive fight on our hands. So I just want to finish up with looking at the impacts of the coronavirus crisis, which obviously have been a big blow to public transport and public transport has been singled out and sometimes demonised as a place where you're most likely to pick up other people's germs. Um, but official guidance has been for us to make essential energy, uh, essential journeys only and to avoid public transport if at all possible. So the short-term impacts of this have obviously been severe but I think it is important that we take a long-term view here because motorised public transport has been around for 200 years and I'm sure it will be around for another 200 years and will only become more important over the next century as we is we have to meet our carbon reduction targets. Um, so there are many ways that we can improve the safety of public transport and regulation and public ownership of our public transport will help us deliver those all, deliver all of those. So if we own and run the buses and trains, we can control the safety for staff and passengers. We can deliver more frequent services, which we obviously want to do, which will reduce overcrowding. Um, and we can upgrade the fleet so it's more spacious, it's air conditioned and um, fitted with multiple entrances and exits. And of course, fare free transport, which they've actually introduced on London's buses, during the crisis um, means that we no longer need to interact and um, pay fares. So this is actually a time of massive opportunity and the absurdities of running public transport for a profit for on a profit basis have been exposed. The need to maximise profits is just not compatible with current social distancing guidelines. And the Scottish Government has given a massive bailout of up to £260 million pounds, um, to keep operators going during the crisis. This is a real opportunity to buy back our buses so that they're finally back in public ownership because public transport is, in the future, going to be one of the industries in, um, in the just transition where we can create more and more green jobs. And because it's the biggest contributor to climate change, transport is the biggest contributor to climate change, it really needs to be a number one priority. So I'll leave that there. Um, and back to Caroline. Thanks very much, um, Ellie, Andrew and Gavin. That was a real whistle-stop tour of all the things that are wrong with our transport, Scotland, <laughs> transport system in Scotland um, and all the things that we need to do to fix it. Um, I just want to recap on some of the things that really stood out for me. Um, we heard about how transport is uh, the, the biggest emitting sector um, in terms of climate emissions in Scotland and that that hasn't improved for 30 years, the transport emissions are actually rising, um, which is clearly incompatible with the, the Scottish Government's desire to act on the climate emergency. 
Um, we heard how this isn't just a, a climate issue, it's also a public health issue and the impacts of, um, of the transport system on our communities and the connectivity of our communities as uh, prices rise and bus routes are cut um, and the air pollution and the, the dangers of collision in deprived communities as their big roads run straight through places where people should be able to, to live, play, work, be together. So, um, you know, this system clearly isn't working for the climate, it's not working for health, it's not working for people to get around. Um, and as Ellie said, public transport is now being run as a, as a business and not a service. Um, I was really struck by the uh, that fact that car mileage might have to be cut by as much as 60% um, by 2035 in order to tackle climate emissions. Um, and, and of course, there was a lot of opportunity talked about in terms of public transport and active travel. Um, so I just want to come over to 